Hello, everyone. Good morning, good day, good evening. It's a pleasure to be part of this, and I'm happy to talk about how to build a structured toxicology knowledge base from unstructured data. I'm Daniel. I work at JT International at the Scientific Regulatory Affairs Reduced Risk Product Toxicology team. So let's dive into it. First, please allow me to use a quote uh, from Paracelsus, probably the most commonly used uh, quote by toxicologists in, in presentations. So all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes the thing not a poison. And this sort of sums up uh, the daily challenge that we're facing. I mean, if you think of water, not something you would consider too toxic, and I'm not talking inhalation here, so all root drinking it, it does have a lethal dose, even um, you know if you can drink too much water. So that's sort of um, it's what this quote is referring to. So toxicology is an extremely broad and complex field. It is a combination of multiple different disciplines, such as chemistry, biology, medicine, statistics, and so on. Because of this combination of multiple disciplines and being so complex and broad, the data comes from many and significantly different sources. And when you take computational toxicology that I have a specialty in, you add on top the computational chemistry, biology, and so on requirements as well, on top of uh, sort of everything that exists historically. So when it comes to toxicological risk assessments, the information gathering part is quite time consuming even for a single substance. Now, if you take a large number of substances that we usually have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, it comes even more of a problem. Within toxicological risk assessment, there's an initial high throughput hazard screening step. And at the bottom, just for your information, if you're not familiar with the risk assessment process, there's the hazard identification part and there's the exposure assessment part that sort of make up broadly speaking, the toxicological risk assessment process. So within this initial high throughput hazard screening step, we have to link substance, so chemical information with toxicological and well, including biological data. And as an output, data needs to be well structured and actually even as an input to be able to handle, to be able to link, and ultimately and the, at the end and even during um, the different steps, it needs to be visualized to check, is the data okay? Uh, do we have any data missing? And at the end, to be able to, to make the risk assessment itself in a somewhat rapid and easy way. So allow me to mention here next generation risk assessment. And the main purpose of next generation risk assessment or NGRA for short, is to eliminate the requirement for in vivo testing uh, by combining all the existing historical data, internal, external data that you might have uh, in vitro, in silico, in chemical, and so on. And this figure uh, is um, from a publication by Unilever and sort of shows the, the challenge at hand that what are the different um, sort of data sources that we have to combine, where they, where they come from, what we need to, need to combine to be able to make a risk assessment conclusion. So the challenge here is that potentially we can have thousands of data points per substance. And I would like to bring your attention to here the collate existing information. Here you have your molecular structures, your in silico predictions, already just this can be in the hundreds, literature information, and then of course your, your in vitro characterization as well. So zooming on in these parts that I just highlighted, uh, already there's uh, a lot of extra layers uh, sort of going down into the rabbit hole. So when we're talking about in silico or experimental data for a different, uh, different effector mechanism, within the, the hazard assessment part. Uh, we have to select in silico methods, different data sources, um, collect experimental data, generate the predictions, and of course need um, overall assessments, reliability scores, and uh, for an effector mechanism, as I said, it can be experimental data, statistical model results, expert results, read across results, and so on. And then these different effect and mechanisms will need to be combined to come to a conclusion for a given endpoint, such as gene mutation, again, uh, do the assessment, 
have a have a confidence score um, and then combine the different endpoints within the hazard assessment framework to then be able to use all this in the risk assessment. Now, this figure actually is from a publication from 2018, and it's actually titled in Silico Toxicology Protocol. A lot of uh, industry stakeholders came together and proposed a way how to handle this, this large amount of data that one would need to do within in Silico Toxicology or even next generation risk assessment. So um, I do refer to this uh, data science hier hierarchy of needs figure, but it's, it's really important. Uh, both with colleagues in IT, both with colleagues in life sciences. Now, everybody wants to do AI, deep learning. That's the buzzword of, I guess, the past few few years or maybe even decades. But the really important part to be able to, to do that, to be able to get there is really how we handle our data. How's the infrastructure? How's the ETL? Uh, you know, how we deal with structured and unstructured data. And as a next step, especially for, for life sciences, while well, uh, generating data is ex, um, expensive and uh, we really need to make sure that, okay, we, we check out for any anomalies, we do our data cleaning and we, we have good quality data available to then build onto analytics, simple machine learning algorithms, and ultimately any decision support systems, such as AIs. Now, this is a poster from um, this year's Society of Toxicology meeting that uh, we've done, and it sort of demonstrates our um, one of our day-to-day -day challenges. And this is applicable, I guess, to, to any industry, to any field. So here we're looking at uh, scanning chemical analysis and toxicological screening of, um, of an aerosol. So the first step is emission scanning. Once we've done that, then we need to identify what we have in the specific emission. So we need to do chemical identification, and then we need to do the toxicological hazard screening. So for this, we need to look at a number of different public data sources. We need to look at structure-based um, predictions as well. So do they, any data gap filling um, with, for example, QSAR models, we'll look at structural alerts for various different um, toxicological endpoints of interest, need to look at um, other structural features such as uh, structure derived uh, parameters such as Kramer classes. Uh, here, uh, there's a summary on the left from, for this example, what we, what we used. But as you can see already here, there are a number of different data sources, they are in different formats, so we need to do um, the ETL, so the extract, transform, and load, I need to combine it and visualize it. So for this exercise, we actually use NIME, and it's been great, but uh, sort of the, the sources change, they get updated, regulations change, uh, structure might have been wrong, you need to correct it. So this way, we, we don't really have a good um, approach to uh, sort of capture that at a given time point, take a snapshot, okay, this was the data that we use, but but you know, uh, if we would do the same thing in a year's time with the updated sources, we could end up with, with a different conclusion potentially. And here you can see it's a simple visualization here, whether you have data listed, not listed, predicted, and so on. So um, sort of everything that I talked about before uh, set up our requirements that like, okay, we can do things, for example, with nine, we can combine the data source, but really we want to have an audit trail of, okay, what happened um, at a given snapshot in time and be able to reuse the data as well. So if we want to do a, a similar assessment, again, one shouldn't have to uh, do it from scratch, but be able to access uh, already generated results. So first thing first is the chemistry. We need to be able to search by various different IDs and also based on structure, for example, for read across, so not just QSARS, but okay, we have data for a similar substance and don't want to get into the discussion of similarity here, but there are ways to do toxicological read across for data gap filling. And uh, as I said, we need the structures for machine learning purposes for QSAR, QSPR models, um, threshold of toxicological concerns, so Kramer classification, uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models, so PBPK models, reaction predictions uh, between molecules, um, and ultimately a decision support system, which stands for DSS. And we also need to be able to handle mono and multi-constituent substances as well. Um, of course, uh, with structures, you're talking mono-constituent substances, but when we're looking with different IDs, for example, such as CAS, you can 
we do have multi-constituent substances as well, so we need to be, handle, be able to handle both. In terms of biology, that's technically any data, including literature, internal, external, in vivo, in vitro, in silico, et cetera. So here, uh, you know, you need to think back to the next generation risk assessment figure that I've shown from Unilever and also from the, the publication on the in silico toxicology protocol, we need to be able to capture everything and more going forward in a flexible way. Now, search is, is really key, as I said, we would need to be able to access what has been done so far where we have data. And CAS is probably the most commonly used um, identifier out there with, with different data sources. But of course, we do need other IDs as well, because if CAS is not available, for example, when we do um, non-targeted analysis, um, we, we need to be able to use other IDs as well to, to get all the relevant tox data. And as said many times already, the history and audit trail is, is really key as well, that, okay, how did we end up um, with that data that ultimately we used to make a specific decision within the risk assessment process? Now, data upload for both chemistry and biology from various sources uh, is also a key requirement, whether it's structured or unstructured data. And also we need to be able to integrate with our existing components, such as single sign-on, SharePoint for different documents, OneDrive integration, and this includes, for example, to be able to upload biological or toxicological data, and NIME as well. As you can see, that's our chosen um, sort of ETL um, data handling tool. Um, so yeah, we wanted to have easy integration with that as well. And another key requirement is to have an overall light system. We didn't want to have too many different components um, to maintain. So to sort of keep things simple and make it easy to, to keep, it, um, keep things updated. And the most important requirement, uh, we have to keep this in mind that it's toxicologists who are gonna be using this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and they are not IT experts. So it needs to, be, uh, needs to have an easy to use interface and good visualization for the end users. So this means to be able to take uh, either a single or as you could see again with the, with the uh, scanning um, analysis, um, list of mono or multi-constituent substances, uh, easy graphical user interface and get say something like this, like a traffic light system. Again, in toxicology, those makes the poison, there's no real go, but uh, at least they can say, okay, we have uh, you know some data that shows, okay, there are no alerts. Uh, it was negative in a specific um, toxicological endpoint test. Um, you know, some could be flagged because they have missing data and some could have you know, no goes. They could be showstoppers where there's harmonized classification, there's data for, for a given endpoints. So what was the solution? And uh, I guess a bit of a spoiler alert, I wouldn't be talking uh, here uh, about this, um, but uh, first we've done uh, our market exploration. So two things we noticed um, with off-the-shelf products that they are incomplete and there are two, um, so not two things we noticed, but two main types here. So one is the closed and not flexible. So actually some might already have toxicological data, which might be appealing, but um, I will talk about this a bit later. Uh, and the second type is the flexible, but empty. Now with any system, of course, as we said, want to keep it lightweight and maintenance is key uh, with keeping things up to date with minimal in-house burden. This is still sort of a requirement, but it was sort of with, with the solution as well. It was really important to avoid too much customization, uh, only needing some, some nuts and bolts or glue with, with an ETL tool such as Nine. So as said, spoiler alert, uh, the decision was made to go with Camaxon. Now Camaxon uh, falls into the category of flexible but empty. And um, as I said, with the, with the closed and not flexible, um, some might already have toxicological data, but uh, you know, data is how it, that, well, life science data, there are a lot of imperfections. So it's really important to be able to curate the data and have a trail of it, what happened, you know, something we noticed two, three, four, five years down the line, be able to do that. So um, actually, if we need to collect the data ourselves, uh, you know, by users, that's acceptable. And also with, with risk assessments, um, different toxicologists tend to rely on, on different assays, different sources. They might actually come to the same conclusion, but we really needed this flexibility to be able to technically future-proof it as well and to, um, yeah, and to make it useful for our purposes uh, at the moment as well. 
another really great feature with Kinexon technology that can handle unstructured data. And we can make use of this for database population, which I will talk about a bit later. There's an easy to use graphical user interface, even for admin and maintenance. And the modularity of different components, including visualization is key as well. So uh, like in Tableau as well, that uh, it's, it's easy to uh, modify the views um, at things. So yeah, we'll talk about this later as well. And another really important feature here is that uh, the APIs are accessible with time. So, okay, how did we go about it? So as said, Camaxon is a sort of a flexible system, but it's, it's an empty database. So first things first, we had to populate uh, the chemistry side and we had to build a consistent chemical structure registry as set for, for QSAR models, PVPK modeling, um, Kramer classes, and so on. And as said, the, one of the great features with Camaxon technology that we managed to get the chemical structures from unstructured documents, so in an automatic way. And I'm happy to say here that this is the first ever integration of their chemical named entity detection with compound and assay data management. So what happened here, a crawl in SharePoint, um, detect the chemical name entities and then automatically populate a compound registration. Now there had to be a bit of customization done to the chemistry and the config space, but this is within system settings. And then we also had to do some mapping of the IDs. So here, for example, cast numbers with internal structure IDs. And this was done by a NIME using the Chemax and REST API, again, emphasizing the importance of why APIs uh, you know, were, were important requirement within this. Now for the biology, um, as talked about in the SOT poster as well, we use NIME for the, for the ETL. And the data then was uploaded via uh, Chemaxon's assay. And here we had to do a bit of mapping to CAS as well on the internal ID to make sure, um, you know, as one of the key criteria within the first slide as well, we had to sort of link your chemistry data to the biology, uh, biological, toxicological data. Now we had the chemistry, we had the biology, we had to do the visualization. So for the structured data, we have created a so-called executive summary within Tableau. And this is what I've been talking about to have this sort of traffic light system, okay, where we have, um, you know, potential no alerts or, or negative assay results, where we have, you know, anything flagged, anything that is that has missing data, and anything that's a potential no go. Also, visualization is really important for unstructured data. And this means um, within Cam Locator to have annotated document visualization in case we didn't have uh, data available within um, you know, the structured data visualization. For example, if you flag, a toxicologist can go and look within the unstructured data within specific documents that is there any, any data of use within the documents that have not yet been converted to the structured data and also be able to um, visualize even documents or not visualize or be able to locate in documents where uh, document ant annotation is not available within Chem Locator, uh, the chemical name that entity hit list. And actually we use Tableau for this as well. And another important feature as well, for example, in Chem Locator to be able to look for similar substances that might have data. This is the toxicological read across that I was talking about. So uh, even if the specific uh, substance of interest or compound of interest is not present, um, you know, in a document, uh, toxicologists can look for, for similar substances that might be useful to, to be able to do initial hazard screening or even the risk assessment. So, we have now a baseline system, data populated. What are the lessons learned and how are we going to be going forward? So let me talk about some of the great features. Um, I said many times uh, the general graphical user interface is, is brilliant. Uh, sort of doing the admin, doing the maintenance, the data population, it's, it's so easy to use. Uh, Marvin JS uh, for getting structures which are even not in the database has been great as well to be able to run some quick structure based predictions, some data gap filling uh, without having to go through the whole registration process. Uh, Chem Locator for the initial population and for adding substances automatically on a regular basis is brilliant. So it really saved us a lot of time at the start. And also as new documents are being added, technically we can sort of do the data population in the background and be prepared sort of anticipate what, um, you know, what substances we might need to do risk assessment on going forward. And um, sort of the biology part to the 
to the complicated chemistry part. So the, the assay makes data upload quite easy as well. And as I said, you know, we can just keep things up to date and anticipate, you know, potentially what uh, substances we need to do risk assessments on. Now, let me mention some of the challenges encountered as well, just for your information. So with Chemlocator, um, document visualization, document annotation sometimes is not perfect. Actually, the annotation part is, is usually okay. The visualization, because you have different PDF formats, um, you know, it's, it's not really Chemlocator's fault here, but uh, more, I guess, people not taking care when they are generating PDFs. And the other is the chemical name entity expansion. It, so it's a great technology, but uh, don't expect 100% hit rate. It will miss certain things, but I know Chemaxon is working hard on this to sort of keep it updated and expand it uh, pretty much on a, on a regular basis. Now, another important thing is Tableau. It's not really designed with uh, life science in mind, I guess, you know, with chemical structures uh, or handling multi-entries. In toxicology or, again, general life science, you do have sometimes conflicting evidence and, um, you know, you would need to add specific conditional formatting. But, um, yeah, luckily we managed to use NIME, uh, sort of NIME came to the rescue to, to sort of bridge these gaps that currently exist with the Tableau technology. And um, some feedback from the toxicologists. So they pretty much were the same. So Marvin JS and the, the name to structure, so N2S is great. It's been a huge help for them to quickly look at structures, uh, you know, find similar structures, generate QSER predictions sort of off the fly with, with different tools, uh, but to have sort of one-stop shop for going from different IDs to, to names. So they really, really, really enjoy that. And uh, the other thing as well, I talked about different toxicologists do, do different um, sort of approaches within risk assessment. And there is a request for more and different visualization op options and potentially more data in Tableau as well. So this flexibility of the system is really, really key going forward that I mentioned in the requirement and doing the, the solution as well. Right, so this is our story so far, um, yeah. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them later. Thank you so much for your attention.